Okay. So uh, I want to introduce uh, Vas Stoyanov. He is a research scientist manager at Facebook AI. He's done a lot of work in, in NLP, uh, most notably recently, including Roberta, uh, a, a very a novel and, and incredibly interesting a word embedding method that's an extension of previous work uh, and, and sort of a way in which Facebook is competing with Google to make the best NLP work. Um, anyway, so he's uh, before uh, uh, he worked at Facebook AI, he was a, a research scientist on the search team of Facebook. Uh, he was also a postdoc at Johns Hopkins and uh, got a PhD from Cornell University on opinion uh, analysis. Uh, while he was at Cornell, he got an NSF graduate fellowship. Uh, and overall, uh, he's done a lot of great work, uh, especially relate, related to NLP. Uh, so with that, I would like you to uh, take it away, Vess, and I, I look forward to the talk. Thank you, Keith. Um, I'd like to think that we actually are collaborating with Google rather than competing on these things. Uh, I think um, <laughs> together we've been able to move the field um, further and further along. Um, so yeah, I don't really see it as a competition as much as it's a collaboration to bring the best language technology. Um, so thanks for inviting me today. It's um, really a pleasure to talk in this seminar. I'm actually really sad that um, I cannot visit in person because I have been to ISI. I know how beautiful the campus is. Um, you have these offices overlooking the ocean. Um, but I'm still delighted to be here to talk to this distinguished group of, of scientists. Um, so um, before I get started, um, just um, um, briefly um, to give you an idea. So I'm part of uh, Facebook AI Applied Research. Um, so we are um, focusing on different areas within applied research, including language understanding, computer vision, speech recognition, personalization, conversational AI, um, and others. And uh, I'm part of the language understanding team, uh, which um, um, the name is LATTE for language and translation technology. And we focus on developing um, state-of-the-art technology and um, brush quickly on the pre-trained representations of text. And today I'll talk about cross-single understanding. We also work on areas such as question answering, machine translation, information extraction, and more. Um, so um, um, we are also a um, full research to production, full psycho NLP team. So we focus both on um, solving um, hard uh, problems and pushing forward the state of the art, as well as um, bringing these technological solutions to real world problems. And so um, here on the left, you can see that we publish papers at conferences. We also um, bring those um, advances that we've um, from the field of NLP to problems such as hate speech identification, um, question answering, which I mentioned before, and other um, really interesting problems. So today I want to talk about a particular problem, which is cross-lingo text understanding, or um, XLU. Um, and this is really about how we scale natural language processing across many different languages. So let me first tell you why um, this is a problem for us. So at Facebook, um, more than half of the people who use Facebook actually don't speak English, and the site itself is available in over 100 languages. Um, so we are a language team. We love this linguistic diversity, but we also recognize that it presents problems when it comes to NLP. Um, so here is what a graph of the languages of the internet look like. Um, I took this one from Wikipedia. Um, within Facebook, the distribution um, looks um, somewhat similar, but unfortunately, I'm not aware, uh, allowed to share this publicly. Um, so you can see that about half of all the content on the internet is in English. And then you have this long tail of other languages, of languages. 
Um, so the typical way in which we develop applications, NLP applications, would, um, is to start with English. So usually we start, we'll um, annotate some training data for uh, whatever we want to do in English. We'll train our English classifier. Then we'll go, we do that for the next language. Let's say this is German in this case, we'll annotate German training data, we train a German classifier, annotate Russian training data, train a Russian classifier, annotate Spanish training data, train a Spanish classifier, um, do the same for French. So I'm just, I'm getting tired even going through telling you about this process. Now you can imagine how um, resource and time um, intensive this whole process is. So if you've gone this far, so now so far we've um, had five languages, um, the good news is that you've covered about three quarters of all the content that's on the internet. The bad news is that every subsequent language covers smaller and smaller size of, um, of, um, of the content. And if you want to cover all the content in all the languages, you need to uh, repeat this process about 95 more times. Um, and you still have a long tail of languages you haven't covered. So clearly this is not the process that we can do for, for all problems for all languages. In fact, very little teams get even this far. Um, you know, usually it requires a lot of perseverance to even do this process for the top few languages. And at Facebook, this is a big problem because we're focusing on, on solving safety problems. Um, and we need to do this for everyone. We cannot just selectively pick, you know, these languages get, you know, um, hate speech identification to work for them and these languages um, don't. So we really need to solve these problems for over 100 languages. We have hundreds of problems. So clearly we cannot repeat this process hundreds of times. And, um, and that's not even the whole story. These problems are also dynamic. Um, the definition, for example, of what hate speech means changes over time. So we won't be even able to keep up um, with this process if, if we're doing this. So instead of doing this process over and over again, um, the technological solution that we are focusing on is called um, cross-single understanding. So let me go over the basics. So cross-single understanding refers to the fact with, that we learn an NLP model, such as a classifier on one language, and then we use it in other languages without uh, requiring any additional training data. Um, how can we do that? Um, so the most straightforward way is um, through using translation. So we can do that the test time. So let's say we start with our English data, we train our English classifier. Um, then it, when we um, serve our model, we'll look at the traffic if it's in English, we'll send it to our English classifier. If it's not in English, we'll send it to a, our translation service, we'll translate it into English and then send it to the English classifier. So this generally can work well, but it's computationally intensive. It requires um, running translation at inference time. Um, so it adds latency to the whole process. Now we can also do this at train time. So we can do translation and train time. We take our English data, we train our English classifier, but then we'll take our data, um, we'll pass it through our translation service, we'll create German training data, Chinese training data, Spanish training data, and we'll train a German and Chinese and a Spanish classifier and so on. Um, so this also, this removes the requirement of running translation at test time, but then you have these hundreds of models which you need to manage and to deploy. Now, another solution is to have a multilingual classifier so let's say we have a universal representation such that um, that all the text is um, presented um, is represented similarly when it means the same thing. So then, if we build a classifier on top of this universal representation, this classifier can handle traffic for many languages as long as um, the 
the hidden representations to which we, um, we which we map um, text is the same. So what can these universal representations be? Well, really the oldest ones are um, word embeddings. So word embeddings have been um, allowing and uh, have been around for a while in NLP. I guess by um, the way in which things develop, we can call them um, Asian now. They're from 2013. Um, so even the first works on word embeddings, notice that the uh, um, the, the structures, um, the embedding spaces tend to be very similar in shape. So this property that, for example, uh, king minus man plus woman equals queen would hold across different languages, which means that the relative geometry of how these words are positioned in embedding space will be similar. Um, so one thing that people have done is starting with these um, embedding spaces, um, we can use some words that we know mean the same thing, and we can rotate one embedding space onto the other so that um, these um, anchor words are aligned, and then aligns the rest of the embedding space. So here's another illustration. Let's say um, we start with um, English and Spanish embedding. Um, I don't think the animation looks really well in Zoom. Let me try again. So we'll start with a uh, um, Spanish and English embedding space will have a dictionary of words that we know mean the same thing, and then we'll rotate the um, Spanish um, embedding space onto the English, and then the words that were not in our dictionary that we didn't know that corresponded each other with each other because the embedding spaces have similar shapes, they would also end up close to each other. Now we can do the same for for sentence embeddings, where we have embedding spaces in which sentences that mean the same thing are embedded close to each other. Um, and now we'll touch upon these methods a bit later on the talk. Um, before I do that, I want to talk uh, briefly about evaluation, but um, let me pause here since we're shifting gears and see if there's any questions. Um, in general, feel free to ask me questions during the talk. I'll try to pause at this um, when we're when we're changing gears and give you um, a few seconds to ask questions. Oh, and just as a reminder for everyone, uh, they're free to use the button raise hand on the right of the screen uh, when they click on participants. Okay. Yeah, thank you, kid. Yeah, please uh, use that button. And I'll try to... Um, I'll try to keep track of that. So evaluation, how do we evaluate cross single understanding? Um, so when we were starting to work on this, uh, which was about three years ago, there were two major benchmarks and they were both about cross single document classification. Um, so one is um, Reuters Corpus V2 and the other ones was different product reviews. So the Reuters Corpus version two um, so here the task is topic classification of news articles. And the way that we evaluate cross single performance is uh, we take English training data, we train our model on English, and then we evaluate the same model um, on um, German, Russian, French, Italian, and Spanish. So we ran some experiments on this. Um, for example, I mentioned the translate train method. Um, these are the results for it. We compare them to universal word embeddings. In this case, um, this method worked um, pretty similar to translate train. And at the time we were working on a new method that was looking at sentence embeddings. And we saw that the results are actually really good on average. We uh, outperformed the other methods by about six points. So we were really excited about these results. Uh, we took the same method applied on our production problems and it didn't work. Um, so I think this kind of gave us a realization that um, we don't have um, very good benchmarks for cross-single understanding because classifications are not always representative. So in particular topic classification can be done quite effectively by spotting certain keywords 
um, but we needed a different, more representative benchmark for, for cross-lingo understanding. So this is how we started working on the XNLI corpus. So NLI and XNLI stands for natural language understanding. Um, so this is a task of, um, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience know about this, but let me just um, go through it. Um, so here the, 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 you're given a two sentences and the task is to predict the relationship between the two sentences. We have a premise. Um, let's say the premise is, he said, mom, I'm home. And then you're given a hypothesis. So let's say the hypothesis um, is he told his mom he had gotten home. So in this case, this one will be entailed by the premise. Um, it could be he called his mom as soon as the school bus dropped him off. So we don't know if that's true or not. So this one is um, neutral. Or um, another hypothesis, um, he didn't say a word. So in this case, um, this will be a contradiction. So NLI has been um, in use as a, a good benchmark for language understanding because it requires a fairly deep understanding of language to make some of these, um, some of these inferences. And also this format and of this benchmark allows for testing for multiple language phenomena and people have actually built on top of this where they've tested um, model strain on, on some of these corpora on, on, on particular lang linguistic phenomena. Um, so um, the research in this area has been driven by the Stanford and the multi-gender um, NLI corpora each of which has on the order of half a million premise hypothesis pairs. I mean, we've seen actually tremendous progress on this benchmark where um, we thought that, you know, it would take several years to reach human level performance on these benchmarks, but now we are uh, past that. Although um, you could argue that, um, you know, we still have work to do on the generalization side. So we created a cross-lingo version of um, the NLI corpus. So here the idea will be the same as classification. A train time uh, will be given only English data, but we create a new um, development and test set, which we um, made available in 15 languages. So at test time, we'll make predictions over um, these 15 languages, which include 14 languages, which are not English. Um, so to create this, uh, well, essentially we follow the same um, crowdsourcing procedure as um, was done for the original corpus. Uh, we gathered new dev and test set, and then we use professional translators to put it into um, the 14 other languages. So let's look at some results on this corpus. Um, so for this, we compare the uh, um, an, a, a universal representation, which um, was based on alignment through parallel data. I won't go into too much detail about that. Um, we compared it to a translate train me method. Um, in this occasion, they um, did um, the same on average. And then um, on the, uh, using translate test, um, we saw slightly better performance. Um, so nothing really surprising here, um, just kind of I'm setting this as a, as a baseline. So since we've worked on XNLI, um, and this corpus actually has been um, used by um, several subsequent works uh, quite successfully, um, since then there, we've seen um, several other uh, corpora being created. Um, some of them are on question answering, including um, our own work on uh, MILCA, MLQA, um, but also we've seen some multitask benchmarks that have um, aggregated different tasks similar to um, how Clue has done it for English. So Extreme was one um, coming from Google and Xclue was uh, one created by Microsoft. Um, so this is setting up the, um, the background for evaluation. And next, I want to um, take a quick detour and talk about pre-trained language models. Uh, and I'll pause for a second here if there are any questions. 
I have a question about the way uh, the extension to other languages uh, is done in order to create the evaluation data. So you said that the majority of the, for the majority of the tasks, translation has been used to extend to new languages. And when you show, when you have shown the results for uh, translation, uh, like translation based lines, it seems that the translation based lines uh, perform better because normally, I mean, we are expecting to have this because translation was used to produce the, the corpus in the first place, which would um, make the, the evaluation bias towards translation. So, yeah, good question. Um, I can see your name um, or video, so I don't know who's asking that question. Oh, can I, you see me now? Yes, I can see you now. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's a very good question and um, thanks for bringing it up. Um, so um, we used um, professional translators, so humans to translate this corpus. Um, and that's definitely um, a shortcoming in the way that we've created the data. So it's not sort of created naturally by, by people creating that in other languages. Um, and that was actually motivated um, because it was um, very hard to find reliable um, Turkers in these other languages. So we kind of went pragmatic about it and just do what we could. Um, but also it's um, maybe not quite as big of a problem because we do use human translators to create the data. Um, and for the translate, train and test, we actually use automatic translation. So um, there is going to be some effects of the human translation in the corpus um, that, you know, some things may sound um, a bit artificial, but it's not as bad as, you know, using automatic translation to create a corpus and then um, using automatic translation methods to evaluate them. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's good to have something to start with. Um, I mean, it's good to have those benchmarks, uh, but also the translation, even the human translation, if it is done from one source language, uh, like it depends on the type of source language you are doing it from. If you do it from English, uh, I think those models, like if you want like all those data sets, if you want to use them when you want to like evaluate on, uh, let's say zero shot on another language, because uh, the majority of zero shot applications, they start from English as a source language. And uh, so those benchmarks, if you translate from English to create them, maybe they would work better than if you uh, try to evaluate this on another uh, zero shot uh, architecture that, uh, that is based on another source language. Let's say English is not uh, like uh, uh, well represented yeah. in that task. Yeah, absolutely agree. That's definitely a shortcoming of, of the corpus. Um, and, and you're absolutely right that there are some artifacts introduced by translation. Um, that's why for some of the other efforts, we follow different procedures where we've tried to uh, find text naturally occurring on other languages. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mariam. Uh, I actually have a question too that uh, follows from what Mariam was, was saying. Um, and that is, uh, uh, how do you address um, that uh, informal language may be different from your translation corpus? Um, and that uh, so what someone might write informally in English could be quite different from what someone might write informally in say Russian or German, even if they're semantically similar. Um, so we, um, if you're asking how we address it on the, on the method side versus the benchmark side, I think uh, what Miriam pointed out um, is completely true that uh, maybe that there are certainly some translation artifacts in the corpus, so maybe, you know, um, we won't see as much of a natural and formal language. Um, 
but from approach standpoint, we just sort of, um, I'll, I'll go through some of the approaches that we use um, that, um, you know, can handle a certain amount of informal language. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's talk about um, pre-trained language models. Um, I'll go very brief over here because I think, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody is familiar with this, but just to kind of give us a, a common ground. Um, or if anybody has been, let's say, in coma for the last two years and just waking up and didn't know what was going on in the field of NLP. Um, so we've had huge successes from um, this self-training or pre-training methods where we can take large amounts of uh, unsupervised text without any labels and train language models on it. So essentially, um, we're self-training by hiding some parts of the text and training the models to predict what was hidden. And then taking these pre-trained models um, and applying them for downstream tasks. So really the first big um, breakthrough was from ELMO. So ELMO was uh, training two LSTM language models, a left to right and a right to left one. And then using um, the hidden representations of LSTMs as uh, con contextualized word embeddings. So this was a drop-in replacement for other word embeddings and it magically um, was just making pretty much any task better. So um, this was from um, Michael Peters' slide, uh, adding Elmo on top of sort of a very generic architecture for, for a different task was um, leading to state-of-the-art results uh, for different methods, including um, natural language inference, as you can see here. Um, the next, um, the next um, really uh, big breakthrough was from BERT. Well, there were several steps um, before BERT, but um, BERT um, 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 came about in uh, late 2018. So here the the training is still the same same idea. We would hide parts of the input and learn to predict it, um, except for now we'll be using sort of these bidirectional transformers. And to do that, we'll uh, replace um, some words in the original sentence with a special mask token and then train the transformer to predict what um, what token was hidden. So this magically then this exact same architecture worked uh, for a bunch of different tasks. So could take this pre-trained model and then um, uh, teach it to perform things like classification by simply putting a, a multi-layer perception on the CLS token of these representations. You can take the exact same model and teach it to do question answering by now uh, putting essentially um, predictions on the output layer of this that predict the start and the end span of the um, answer in, in an extractive setup. Um, so um, Google, so uh, BERT um, performed the set. So again, the exact same architecture with very little modification could be applied to many tasks and could do much better compared to the previous state of the art. So this is looking at the uh, GLUE results. So GLUE is one of these benchmarks that accumulates different tasks. Um, and here BERT compared to the previous state of the art was doing um, more than six um, points better on average, uh, which is a, was a huge jump. And this is already on a competitive um, model that's using pre-training. Um, so um, we, as, as Kit was mentioning earlier, um, we also were inspired by that work. Actually, at the time that uh, BERT was coming out, we was, were working on um, somewhat similar version of um, bidirectional transformers used for pre-training. Um, so it was working also much better than the current state of the art, but not quite as well as BERT. So when BERT came out, we really wanted to understand what was important for, for training a model like, like BERT. And so we um, began studying it. And as we did, we actually realized that BERT is significantly under-trained. 
So we um, um, we gathered our, our um, knowledge and we trained another model, which we called Roberta. Um, and um, Roberta was performing quite a bit better than Bird. And on, in fact, he was performing on par or better than any other published pre-training method, which included at the time um, another method um, such as ExcelNet. So I won't go into too much detail. Um, I want to kind of share this interesting anecdote. So when um, we published the paper, as as you know, all the um, research nowadays is done, we published this paper on Twitter, um, and then. Um, our the first author on the paper, Ying Han, who is Chinese, said, "Hey, um, your tweet is is trending on Chinese Twitter." So naturally, I wanted to understand what was going on. So I went to a um, a translation engine and translated it. Um, so here is what um, came out. So um, the first uh, passage says, "The Bird King is back. Facebook launches a new model." of Roberta crushing ExoNet system top three ranking. So I don't know about crushing, crushing. We were about 0.1% better, which is really statistically a tie, but hey, you know, we'll take it. Um, and the second one, um, I think is a good summary of um, what, the, what the paper was about, which is as long as the training is good, the bird can exceed the performance of all subsequent methods. So this was, uh, Roberta, it was essentially a new training recipe uh, for BERT. And here are the um, comparison on the GLUE benchmark. So as I was saying, ExoNet was um, the dominant uh, method, at, um, was the top method at the time. And we did um, essentially um, the same as, as ExoNet, uh, but they're sort of, um, some some interesting um, trade-offs because uh, Roberta is essentially using the same architecture as Bird, whereas Sexonet was uh, um, proposing that these uh, permuted language models are a better way to train. And compared to Bird, uh, we can see that um, we did almost um, four points better on average um, compared to well, maybe two to three points better on average compared to um, uh, on on these um, tasks in Glue. So since um, Roberta, we've actually been scaling, the field has been scaling even further. So we had Albert, which was um, a less param using less parameters than Roberta, but more computation, uh, which said a new state of the art on the Glue benchmark. And then we had Google's T5 model, which has more parameters and more computation, uh, but um, gets even better results and is able to um, generate um, text. Um, so really interesting model. So um, the next um, segment of the talk will be how we use um, these pre-training methods for cross-single understanding. Um, let me pause again for a second and give you um, give you an opportunity to ask questions if you have any. Okay, so I will talk about um, three different methods here. Um, so the first one is multilingual bird. So at the time that um, Bird was coming out, there was almost um, a footnote into uh, the GitHub repository that said, we've also trained Bird on, on data from more than 100 languages. And what was amazing was that um, this model was able to do um, cross-single transfer. Um, so we um, hypothesized that there's common words, lemmas and code switching between different languages which align the representation. So then you can do a cross single transfer. So when they published the model um, in that repository, there were also results on the XNLI data set, um, which um, clearly illustrates the advantage of releasing benchmarks publicly. Um, so um, first, there were a few interesting observations. First, if we compare um, the baselines that we had in the XNLI corpus to 
um, birth. Um, so the English performance is quite a bit better as we could expect. So almost eight points of accuracy better uh, for, for English. And now this advantage also translates to other languages where we see on average um, the translate train method um, compared to translate train uh, with LSTM, it does um, almost seven points uh, better on average. Now, when interestingly for BERT, translate uh, train was, is doing better than translate test. And also, as I was mentioning, um, this model can perform zero shot uh, performance, which means that um, this model can be trained only on English and then test on these other languages without using any translation or any additional alignment. And it does um, on par with what we were doing uh, on par with our best methods before that we're using translation. And that was quite interesting. So the second method um, that I'll talk about is massively multilingual sentence embeddings. So this is using the same idea of um, embedding sentences in the same space. Um, and this time it's based on translation. Um, so following um, the the traditional paradigm for machine translation where we have an encoder and a decoder. So the encoder will take a, a sentence in the source text um, and encode it and the decoder will de decode it in the target desk, de um, um, target language. The only difference from a traditional machine learning setup is that we won't use attention over all the hidden states of the encoder, uh, but instead we'll force the encoder to produce a single sentence, uh, a single embedding for the sentence. And then um, we'll um, train this on many languages, we'll train bigger models, we'll pre-process the data well. Um, and that um, doing that led to very strong um, cross single performance. So here are the results in the zero shot setting without using translation. Um, so few interesting observation. First, um, this method is based on sentence embeddings coming out of LSTM. So for English, it's doing uh, quite a bit worse than, than BERT. Uh, but cross-lingual is actually um, doing better um, across all almost all languages. Um, and on average, it's doing about um, four points better. Now, if we add the results with translation, then things don't look quite as good. So with translate train, BERT is still better on average than this massively multilingual sentence embedding. Um, so this leads me to the next model that I'll talk about. So this is um, XLM or cross-single language model. So here the idea will be very similar to BERT, but we'll specifically target cross-single transfer, cross-single understanding. So we'll have um, two um, components in the training. One will be the traditional mask language model. And we also will train with um, translation language model where we'll use parallel data to, to show to the model. So this is what it looks like. Uh, for mask language model, we use the same setting as BERT. We'll have a sentence um, in, in a single language and we'll mask up, uh, some part of it. And then for the translation language model, we'll concatenate um, up to parallel sentences. So in this case, we have a English and a French sentence concatenated together, and we randomly mask some parts of it. But if the model learns um, cross-single correspondence, it can learn, for example, that chat uh, in French corresponds to cat in English, and it can do better at predicting this missing word because of that. So looking at the X and the Y results again, um, we'll compare um, the zero shot on K setting uh, with the um, XLM setting train only on mask language model. So this training is actually very similar to the BERT training, um, and, but we see that it's um, doing better on English and on other languages. Um, so you might wonder why that is. Um, and I think the answer here is that um, for XLM training, um, they used a lot of the similar um, improvements that we also saw that um, work for Roberta. 
And now if we add um, the translation language model, we see that for zero shot transfer, that gives us almost four points improvements um, on average. So if we look at with translation now, where um, we had the stronger results, so um, comparing BERT with translate chain to XLM with um, MLM and TLM for, for zero shot transfer, this is already doing better. But then if we add translation to um, XLM, it can we can squeeze an extra point of performance. And interestingly here again, translate chain is doing better than translate test. Um, so the last model that I'll talk about here is XLM Roberta or XLMR. Um, so here is essentially, um, we were wondering what if we give the Roberta treatment to XLM and see how far we can push it. So the idea will be the same. We will want to understand what's important for, for XLM training and we want to scale it up. Um, so we did, um, uh, quite a bit of ablation studies for, for this. I think one really important factor was um, is the amount of training data. So for um, XLMR, we use uh, data collected from Common Crow, um, and we had about 2.4 terabytes of data in 100 languages. So this is comparing um, Common Crow data to Wikipedia data, which was used for training um, XLM and, and multilingual BERT. You see, we have quite a bit more of it, and especially for for the tail of languages, um, for some of them, we have several orders of magnitude more training data. So how important is the data? Um, this ablation study compares the um, effect of increasing the amount of training data. Um, so comparing Wikipedia and Common Crow, we see that um, um, is very helpful, particularly for low resource languages, which um, leads to improvement on average. So here we have low resource on the left, high resource in the middle, and, and um, the average performance on the right. Um, so we also observe um, the effects of transfer versus inference. So transfer refers to the fact that as we um, continue adding languages to the training. Um, the training particular of a lower resource language is improved because we can, oh, well, at least the hypothesis is that we're transferring some of the knowledge from high resource to low resource languages. And now the performance for high resource languages almost always decreases as we add more languages and um, we attribute that to the fact that um, these different languages will be competing to for the same parameters in the model. So this is um, what we call inference, in, in, interference. I'm sorry, this there's a typo and I'm actually saying it. Um, so in, we also see the same effect for low resource languages that even for them as we continue adding more and more languages, um, the performance increases in the beginning but then starts to taper off. Um, now, one way in which we can um, combat interference is by um, adding uh, more capacity to our model. So if there's more parameters, there will be less interference. And here we can see with the orange, if we increase capacity, uh, we can um, improve um, performance and combat the interference, although it still um, um, has effect when we add 100 languages. Now we can um, also do language sampling to balance the amount of training data from different languages the model sees. Um, so if we set, um, we have a parameter that we set to zero, essentially we'll sample um, the same amount from every language. And if we set it to one, we'll set, uh, we'll sample proportional to the amount of data that we have from each language. So we see that um, sampling a lower a parameter definitely helps low resource languages, but it hurts slightly a high resource languages, which are less frequent in the data. So we think we settled on a value around 0 0.4, which was a good trade-off. Um, then surprisingly increasing, well, maybe not surprisingly, but increasing vocabulary size um, really help um, 
the performance. Um, so, um, and we could do that either by keeping the number of parameter constants and taking away some of the transformer parameters using it for vocabulary. So these are the blue bars. We see that it helps up to 256,000 um, words in the vocabulary. Or we can um, keep the transformer size fixed and keep adding embedding parameters. And then uh, we simply went up to half a million uh, vocabulary size. So we did all these studies. We figure out um, sort of what are good settings. And then we train our final model, which is this 2.4 terabytes data. Um, we also figure out that um, trans the translation element, which was using the parallel data, uh, was actually not helping performance, which was counter to the findings of the XLM paper. But um, I think we've observing we've been observing that a lot of the uh, assumptions change um, in large scale. So finally, we trained this model for I think um, three or four weeks, um, and this is the performance that um, we got out of it. So the previous um, state of the art was the XLM with um, MLM and translation language model using translate train. So XLM R zero shot without translation uh, was doing um, about two points better on average. Now we figure out there's also another setting for using translation, which um, helps quite a bit, which was we would um, use translate train. We would take the English data and translate it to all the training languages. And then we would um, train a single model on the combined data for all languages. So this is um, translate train all setting. And that was the best setting uh, for XLMR, which did about um, almost five points better on average um, on the XNLI data uh, benchmark. And we also have results for other benchmarks, by the way. Um, since there was questions about the benchmark quality, which are um, which are quite reasonable, so this is um, um, our uh, this is how performance on uh, the XNLI benchmark has grown. This is um, a little over two years now that we've had this benchmark. We've made some amazing progress. So we started at about sixty six. Um, percent accuracy across the transfer languages. We're now um, above 80 percent. And there's still more work to be done. But um, it's been amazing to see this progress. And I, we're at a point where um, these methods are useful in, in practical settings. Um, now, let me pause again for a second. Um, any questions? Excuse me, can you explain once more how translate train all is different from translate train? Yeah, um, so for translate train, we would take um, our training data translated to all the different languages and then we'll train one classifier for each language and evaluate it. For translate train all, we'll do the same except for we'll train one classifier for all languages. So we end up with single classifier that's trained on the data translated in all the languages of the test data, of the test corpus. I see, thank yeah, you. As opposed to many different ones. And, and actually, this is helpful to, to the performance. Uh, we believe that there might be some effects of um, data augmentation. Um, as we know, like um, back translation, for example, has been used successfully for data augmentation. I see, thank you. Um, so, um, just I guess one other really exciting development that I want to share here before uh, before um, I finish. Um, so, um, when remember how I told you that multilingual word can do cross lingual transfer, and I told you that that's due to common words lemmas and code switching that we, um, I misled you a little bit because this was our understanding at the time. But I think since we've actually realized that that's not the case, that actually you don't need any common words, lemmas and code switching to align the different languages, which for me was completely mind boggling. 
at the time. Um, so here is what I mean. So um, this was work of our intern, Shi Ji Wu. Um, so it, as I was saying, our uh, hypothesis is that um, common lemmas, uh, code switching, words in common, those are, um, those are serve as anchor points to align different languages. So um, when Shiji came, we had this hypothesis that if we artificially add more anchor points, um, so we take um, text and we replace some words um, in the text with words from another language. So we hypothesized that this will help with the cross-single alignment. So we did this experiment. So here you see in the blue bars, the, the default system. And in the dark green bars, um, we added um, extra artificial anchor points. So we saw that performance improves a bit, but probably not as much as, um, as we, we thought that it would improve. So we said, okay, what if we then just remove all the anchor points? So we make sure that there are no common words and lemmas uh, between the two languages that we train on. And we can do that by um, essentially using a language specific token and uh, appending it to all the words. So there's completely no overlap between the vocabulary on which we train. So we did that experiments in the light green bars and surprisingly that actually hurt performance very little. Um, we were expecting that, you know, will be um, much worse than that. So what's going on? We, we kind of hypothesized that um, because these transformers are sharing parameters across different languages, that's what's actually resulting in the alignment. So we tried instead to separate different layers of the transformer so that they're not shared across the, the pre-training in different languages. Well, here you see in this graph, the blue is the default performance. Then we separate the word embeddings, um, separate the first three layers or the first six layers. Of, I think this was a 12 layer transformer. So you see the one we separate the first six layers, we're almost at random performance. So what is going on here? So our hypothesis is that much like uh, word embeddings where, you know, we had this um, similar shapes of the embedding spaces, um, we hypothesize that the same holds for the hidden states of the activations of these transformers. Um, and because these transformers are actually sharing parameters, um, there is an advantage of learning aligned representations. And this is what happens in these models. Um, so we did some work to um, validate this hypothesis. Basically, um, this um, graph here showed that we can align the hidden activator models and they perform on par or better than word embeddings for uh, for alignment um, and we can on the right you can also see that um, if we look at different layers as we go higher um, the uh, the models align a little bit better um, we also um, have this very interesting experiments in which uh, we look at um, alignment between, so for example, in the second graph, we'll train a BERT model on English and on French data completely. So we can either train a bilingual transformer that, um, that is trained on data from both languages, um, and we can compare it to two monolingual transformers, one trained on French and one on English, and then we compute this uh, metric of how well the hidden states of the two transformer align. And so we can see on the bilingual transformer uh, and, and we can do that by using sentences that we know are parallel. So you can see on the bilingual case, they align quite well. On the monolingual case, um, so these are trained separately um, and they won't automatically correspond to each other, but we can align them reasonably well, especially um, the lower layers. Um, and if we compare that to a random uh, model, um, then it will do quite worse. And the first um, um, plot here has the same results. So we 
train on two versions of English. So we take um, two, um, we take essentially the same English corpus, uh, but we would um, create two separate vocabularies for it as if it was two on different versions of English. So this is kind of mind boggling again and kind of um, um, goes a bit into work that Kevin Knight at ISI has done in deciphering languages. So it's a bit like where um, these models are, we can use them to decipher languages. So we can take a language, a speaking human language that we know nothing about um, and then train these um, big language models and have it aligned to um, a language like English and then use it for cross-lingual transfer. So that's all that I had today. Um, in summary, I'm really excited about the progress that we've been doing on cross-lingual understanding. It's an important problem for us. Um, and, um, and we are using this to make um, difference in real world tasks. Um, so um, thank you for your attention and we have a few minutes for question. Yeah, thank you, Vess. Uh, and, and as you said, we do have some uh, time for uh, two questions. So uh, does anyone have questions at the moment? All right, well, I have uh, uh, some questions, uh, which I'll, I'll actually bring up more of these uh, when we talk in person or one-on-one or -on -one, uh, this afternoon. Um, but uh, one question I had was, let's see, I have a few questions. Um, yeah, I guess um, I, I, I'm not familiar, I'm not super familiar with anchoring, um, but it sounds like, uh, you basically find that the, the anchoring or not, the, the, the model works very similar. And you're saying that this is due to uh, parameter sharing. And, I, and although you were discussing that in the last slide, I, I just wanted to better understand what you mean by parameter sharing. So uh, I, I'm imagining these, these data are uh, embedded in space and the, and the, and the uh, space does not perfectly align. So you have a universal model and it's able to work despite the different alignment of the languages? Uh, uh, what, what do you mean exactly? Yeah, so remember I was showing this, um, this slide about how word embeddings are similar shapes across languages. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that um, our hypothesis is that the same holds for activations of the hidden states of the transformer. Um, so much like, much like this um, will have similar shapes, like a French, uh, a, tra a bird train on French and a bird train on English will have similar hidden activation spaces. Now, um, this, they probably will be more different than, you know, the hidden states of a Chinese a transformer train on Chinese, um, but there still will be similarities in the shape. But um, when, for these word embeddings, if you um, train them sort of separately, uh, one word embedding for each language, they won't come out aligned by na naturally, you will have to rotate them. But here with the transformers, um, we hypothesize that uh, because there is this pressure of reusing parameters and that's more efficient to represent the same semantical structures, um, in the same way that that happens automatically during training. Um, so in the paper, we have some experiments that validates the hypothesis that um, the shapes of the hidden embedding spaces are similar. And then we have these experiments that show that uh, in a transformer, um, they are learned. Um, so the representations that are learned are already aligned and uh, we can do zero shot um, transfer without knowing which words correspond on, uh, between different languages. Excellent. Um, uh, and uh, I guess we're out of time now, but uh, I, I, I will have a few questions, few more questions uh, about your, your interesting talk this afternoon. Um, with that, uh, maybe uh, I see some people are turning off their, or, or, or unmuting themselves. Is there maybe one more question? Yeah, I had a quick one if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Hey, this is John. 
Um, so uh, earlier in the talk, you talked about how um, uh, Roberta, you know, you, you, you recognize that Bert was under trained and so you went and did what you did for Roberta. So I wanted to get a sense of, of like, what's the intuition that you use when you're looking at trying to train something with Bert and you're like, that, that loss is going down, but I bet it could go lower. Like, where's the, how do you know or pre predict something is, is quote unquote under trained? Is this a matter of just like trying every possibility and like finding the ones that get better? Or is there some kind of a, uh, intuition going on behind saying, ah, no, nah, next sentence prediction, that's, that's, that's not useful. We're not going to do that at all. Or just like, you know, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good question. I think the process actually work with, we wanted to understand, for example, is next sec sentence prediction useful? So we ran an ablation with and without it. And we saw that actually we're getting better results without it. Um, similarly, we tried other things like um, the way that we dynamically sampled the data. Um, so it was um, a combination of um, an intuition of what made work better plus like trying to understand some of the assumptions that were baked into the algorithm um, and, and testing them, those out. Thanks. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, with that, I think we're out of time, but many of you will have one-on-one -on -one sessions this afternoon. I certainly will and I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, and with that, I think we can uh, end the meeting uh, and uh, you can uh, stop recording